What's going on, friends? It was Harley Davidson's most powerful lineup that they never actually produced, and also, quite possibly, could be one of the greatest what-if stories in the history of motorcycling. So in 1976, Harley-Davidson undertook a very ambitious project. The project was codenamed NOVA. And NOVA, at the heart of NOVA, were some of the most top secret, most technologically advanced, and powerful engines at the time. If Harley would have done this, it would have blown the lid off of the industry. Harley would have likely beat out Honda, having a V4 while Honda was still in development. Even today, the details are still a little bit obscure on Project Nova, but what we do know is what was proposed was a 60-degree V-twin overhead cam, liquid-cooled, and either a 400 or 500 cc version, and then a V4 in a 800 or 1000 cc version, and then, get this, even a V6 in either a 1200 or 1500 cc version. That's pretty impressive when you consider all this was come up between 1976 and the early 1980s. So guys, before we get too far into today's video, please don't forget to give it a like if you enjoy it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Each engine was going to be internally counterbalanced, and they were going to share the same bore and stroke dimensions, so this would allow the parts to be interchangeable across each different engine platform, and also, the top of the line engine being that V6, they were targeting 135 horsepower. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot today, but that's a lot for Harley-Davidson. And even in a V6, you gotta think, this was the mid-70s, early 80s, 135 horsepower was more than anybody else had at the time. Now, these engines were originally designed with two valve heads, but engineering was thinking of the future. So the way they designed the heads, it wouldn't be an issue to go ahead and start manufacturing a four valve head on the same platform without having to completely re-engineer the head. Now, when you look at these motors, they look like they're air-cooled, but that's a little bit deceiving because they were actually gonna be water-cooled, and for the water-cooled portion, we're gonna enter Porsche. So Porsche was a logical choice because Porsche had successfully moved from air-cooled engines to water-cooled engines, and without completely, let's say, alienating their base that loved the air-cooled motors. Now, with Porsche handling the engine and transmission design, Willie G. Davidson and his team were going to take care of styling, and the engineers at Harley-Davidson were going to work on the chassis and every other component of the motorcycles. I mentioned liquid cooling, and we all know what Harley-Davidson thinks of liquid cooling. No way was Willie G. Davidson going to allow some giant radiator to be stuck on the front of any motorcycle that he designed that carries the Harley-Davidson name. So they had to come up with a plan. And it was a pretty uh, ingenious plan, albeit very... It led to some really crazy bodywork on these bikes. So what they did was they took the radiator and they laid it flat under the seat. Now laying it flat under the seat, that's all well and good, but how's it going to get air? This led to these crazy bodywork designs with these big scoops on the front of the bike, which kind of looks like a VMAX. So the scoops would draw in air to the radiator when you're running down the road, and so when you're sitting still, you know, naturally an electric fan was going to be put in place to help keep that radiator with some air flowing through it. Now also under your seat was where they placed the fuel tank, and for fueling the engine, it was originally planned to be produced with carburation, but they also had a plan for future fuel injection on this model, which having a fuel-injected motorcycle in the 1980s, that was quite something. Now, where the traditional fuel tank was on this bike's design, with the fuel tank being under the seat with the radiator, they utilized the area under what would be a fake gas tank for basically all of the electronics and the ductwork which routed the air to the radiator. The fairing that they designed for this bike, they actually tested it in a wind tunnel, and they put some really nice little creature comforts in there, because you got to think, this is late 70s, early 80s, so a locking compartment, an open compartment, and some stereo speakers, that was quite a big deal back in the day. Something that we really take for granted today on our big touring motorcycles. Harley-Davidson also took their engine and made it a stressed member of the chassis. So by making it a stressed member of the chassis, it eliminated the need to have the front down tubes on the front of the motorcycle, which cleaned up the look and also saved quite a bit of weight on these bikes. Now, Harley-Davidson spent between 10 and $15 million developing this motorcycle, and as I mentioned, this was the, about 1976 to the early 1980s. 
they had approximately two dozen completed running engines and even about a dozen completed prototype motorcycles. These motorcycles had even been wind tunnel tested, dyno tested, and they were already road testing these machines. Even some of Harley's top brass at the time got to actually test ride these machines and they had nothing but good things to say about the power of the machines themselves. So what happened and why didn't they produce these motorcycles? They spent all this time and money, they had an excellent design going, and they could have blown the doors off the industry by introducing a powerful V4 and even a V6 at that time. Well, there was another engine that was being developed alongside it, and that is the Evolution engine. So with the buyback from AMF, it all boiled down to just a lack of money. The investors that bought Harley-Davidson back from AMF, they couldn't afford to produce both motorcycles side by side. Even though all this money had been spent on developing this, they had all the tooling they needed to do it, everything was in place, they just didn't have the funding to produce both motorcycles. So naturally, they went with what they knew, they went with what, with what was proven, and they went with the Evolution engine. And as history would suggest, that was the smart idea. But not all was lost on the Nova project. The actual fairing that was wind tunnel designed that was originally intended for the Nova motorcycles made it into the 1983 FXRT Sport Glide and also did the saddlebags. Well, I mean, $15 million is a pretty high price to pay for design of and development of a fairing and saddlebags, but anyhow. And also the relationship that the Harley-Davidson had built with Porsche came into play a little later on with the V-Rod engine and its design. So guys, it's really hard to think about Harley-Davidson today and what it might have looked like if they had chosen either direction. If they had dumped the Evolution engine and produced Project Nova, or if they were able to actually produce them both side by side. I think Harley-Davidson would have a much more diversified base. And even if they had got that Nova project out on time and done right, they probably could have honestly competed with and or topped Honda in that market segment. So it really is a big what if. What if Harley-Davidson had actually put Project Nova into production? Harley-Davidson might have looked a lot different today. Heck, Harley-Davidson might have even have been able to compete head-to-head -head with the big four Japanese manufacturers, Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki. But... Project Nova was a huge risk, and given the circumstances at the time, I personally feel like they made the right decision in pushing forward with the Evolution engine, as going with Project Nova could have been a major, major risk. Well, it was a major risk, and if it failed, it literally could have cost them the company in its entirety. But as we're moving into the modern era, once again, we've seen Harley-Davidson try to do the exact same thing. They had the Milwaukee 8, and then they came out with the Revolution Max engine. But, of course, we know with the CEO changes, he's looking at trimming all those things back and just really focusing on their core customers, even though we are expected to see the Pan America later this month, which I'm kind of interested to see how that motorcycle is going to stack up in an already established segment with the Adventure Touring motorcycles and BMW being the top dog out there with their Adventure Touring bike. But anyhow, guys, that's all I've got for you this week. I want to thank you for watching, and guys, please stay safe out there on the roads. It is ice and snow out here about the, for about the next week where I'm at, but hopefully you guys are able to get out and ride. So please, dodge the cars, stay safe, and I'll catch you guys in next week's video. Thank you for watching.